Guys, if you want to relive the fantastic spirit of that time, be there on December the first. Okay, I'm going to do something a bit different. That you know, not the biographical thing. I want to talk about milk crates, right? Which I think are the symbol of the DIY music revolution, right? Because it's a great example of a group of people taking a simple technology that was made for something else and adapting, appropriating it for their own use. More than a symbol, it's actually the most highly functional object you can find because, well, it can be whatever you want to be. It keeps changing. You can put your amp on it. You can run a hot lighting desk on it. You can create a bed base out of it. You can create a kitchen table out of it. You can do client put four other milk crates there, climb over a fence and steal more milk crates. How much does it cost? It's free. And it is all around, particularly in early morning, late night in the inner city. Right? And it's very punk because you have to be in the know. You have to have sus to know when you see milk crates, which are hiding in plain sight, you see? And geometric designs were really the mod thing revived for punk rock. However, for ancient mythology, talismans that go way back, Indian mythology, where the swastika comes from and all that, cross symbols, power, are central, you find the keystone, you slot it in, and new realities emerge. That's why the milk crate is the central and most important symbol of the DIY music revolution, which I was part of arriving in the absolute mess in 81, 82, that was the Melbourne music scene. Now, I'm, I'm not going to do the fantastic biographical thing, however, I'm going to read from my book, which I call Biographical Fiction. Okay, so it's fiction, but it's based very heavily on biography, and I should, um, on the front of this book, because what else can you use a milk crate for? To be noticed. To get that extra 12 inches, which every man wants. To go, hello. Okay, this is from a uh, story called Farewell, My Ugly. Some of you may well know of a book called Farewell, My Lovely. This, however, is a uh, tribute to the original story, but set in the inner city about an ex-punk rocker who's contacted by one of his old mates to do a favour for him. Anyway, the start. I'll just read a short excerpt. It begins. Farewell, my ugly. I've always had an old face. When I was a little kid, they called me old man. When I became a teenager, pimples appeared. They were the big red pustule ones and left bad scars. Also, I was the first kid to start shaving. I couldn't shave where the pimples were, so my face was made up of scars with tufts of wiry black hair sticking out. I played football in the under 15s and scared the bejesus out of other teams. They called me Herman, as in Herman the monster. Good on you, Herman. I lived in a green weatherboard suburban house with my mum, Florence, who reclined on couches all day, on cushions sewn with decorative pictures of snow capped European Alps, but with gold rope. My dad wasn't home much because he was at the furniture showroom seven days a week being. Freddy the fa Fantastic Furniture Fella. <laughs> but I didn't care. School was finishing and I was free to roam the inner city, which in those days was mostly a decayed Victorian city filled with workers during the week, but empty on weekends. Dad wanted me to go into the furniture business, but I couldn't care less. I enrolled at uni. Uni seemed okay at first because people recognised me for my brains, not my old man crater face. After a while, however, it seemed obvious girls in the class started backing away the moment I entered the lecture theatre. So, one night, feeling lost and alienated in a decaying Victorian inner city, we love that, uh, 
I walked past a pub called the Duke of Isles. A band was playing in the corner. There was hardly anyone there. The band was loud and jumping around like mental patients. I guess they'd scared off the regulars. Pretty good, I thought. The next week I went back, and the week after that, I found to my amazement that the people who went to the Duke of Isles were, like me, odd bod youth who couldn't fit in with a surfy haircut, stripy t-shirt, chocolate milk lifestyle that dominated everywhere in Australia you went, like some Hitler youth movement. <laughs> Before you could say Freddie the Fantastic Furniture Fella, I'd been invited to join the band, the Prime Eagles. This must have been because of my primeval looks. Since I knew zip about playing bass, I got the basic four notes down and we started playing at the Duke of Isles. Incredibly, people liked it. After a lifetime of schoolyard name calling, I was stunned when people told me I looked cool on stage. They even cheered me on like the football team. Go Herman, go! <laughs> After the gigs, people were surprised to find that the bass player, who looked like a depraved criminal from a 1940s black and white movie, was a nice reserved chap. A mummy's boy, in fact. We played at the Duke and other small pubs around the inner city until one night, after a chaotic gig, the singer chucked a king-size mental and the Prime Eagles broke up. Oh. I got asked to join another band by two sisters who called me Humphrey instead of Herman because they thought I looked like Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> they designed grey monochrome suits with page boy collars for the band to wear while they wore tall beehive wigs and sang harmonies. The Soul Review gig at the Duke didn't go so well. Bottles were thrown. After three gigs, they said they were rethinking the concept and I was out. <laughs> After that, I hung around the Duke less and went back to uni. I wasn't that desperate to be on the stage and the little scene had become infiltrated by a wanker element and was no longer such a laugh. Anyway. <laughs>